Uh, very good afternoon to everyone. This is uh, today we are going to discuss about surgical emergencies in NICU. And uh, so I would be covering about the surgical emergency which involve the lungs, uh, GIT, renal, CNS, and others. So come, starting first with the lung malformations because it involves a lot of uh, respiratory management and uh, resuscitation, resuscitation management. And uh, I think it is pretty much common, which we often encounter, and it disguises various neonatal respiratory disorders in early uh, neonatal period. So it is very important that we should be uh, uh, knowing about and uh, uh, reading about it in much detail. So first, starting with the congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So in this case, there is a defect in diaphragm that resulted in herniation of intestinal contents in thorax. And apart from uh, intestinal contents, there could be liver, spleen, and other organs also, which could can herniate. So what is the problem in this condition occurs that because of this, uh, that, that side of uh, pulmonary uh, lungs doesn't develop well. So it, the first effect is pulmonary hypoplasia in this condition. The second important effect is that it is not only the lungs parenchyma which is involved, but also the pulmonary vasculature. So other problem is in this condition which occurs, which have, we have to deal, deal with is the pulmonary hypertension. And there also occur displacement of heart or may or may not be there could be associated even congenital heart disease simultaneously there. So it is commoner on the left side. Incidence is approximately one in 4,000 life births. And it could be associated with other congenital anomalies and syndromes also like uh, cardiac anomalies, renal anomalies, and like in the Down syndrome, Edward syndrome, Turner syndrome. So it is very relevant that with every congenital malformation, it is the victim that when you have one, you will scream for uh, another. So when you, whenever you encounter one congenital anomaly, you have to scream for other organs. It is true. It holds true for all the systems. So survival is a uh, pretty good in developed countries, but it is still not okay in uh, lower and middle income countries. That is approximately half of the which we see in the developed world. So uh, often it is because of the non-availability of uh, ECMOs and uh, pulmonary based relative therapy in every center. So uh, it is uh, circumscribed to only a few survey centers. And even in the uh, survivors, morbidity is, is very high and we will discussing about it. So the anatomical types include 85% uh, on the left side and 13% on the right side. So mostly they are posterior. There could be a small percentage of anterior hernia also. So uh, the problem which, which arises because of the CDH is because of the pulmonary hyperplasia, cardiac dysfunction, pulmonary hypertension. So it is very imperative that a baby should be comprehensively evaluated for all these three. Because if we only focus on the uh, alveolar or pulmonary management and uh, bypassing the cardiac dysfunction, not taking care of pulmonary hypertension, the baby is not going to improve. So uh, as already have been told that there is a compression and, uh, of the ipsilateral lung and also it, if it is very big, it can lead to the contralateral lung also can be hypoxemic. The cardiac dysfunction occurs because of the uh, associated pulmonary hypertension that subsequently lead to right ventricular dysfunction first and uh, later stages it leads to left ventricular dysfunction also. So uh, there are predictors of uh, pulmonary hyper hypoplasia in antenatal ultrasounds and uh, important fact is that in CDS if it is detected early in the embryonic period it is more severe and if it is de detected in the later gestation it is less it is having lesser severity. So most of the uh, uh, presentation of CDH which occurs in the neonatal age would have a, a very early uh, ultrasound findings. And in the ultrasound find, findings, the one pretty important predictor which we all should know is the lung head ratio. So in this condition, the uh, ipsilateral lung is already compressed where the hernia is. So control lateral lung is taken for the ratio measurement to the baby's head. And if it is less than one, it is a poor prognostic factor. Then this ratio varies with the gestation. So according to gestation, there is observed and, uh, and uh, expected LHR. That should, uh, if it is less than 25%, then it is a problem. The percentage predicted lung volume, if it is not more than 15%, then it is also abnormal. And then there is a total lung volume capacity also, which, is, which can be measured. And 
the couple can be prognosticated. The clinical features which is present uh, is that because of the herniation of intestinal content, there would be a schizoid abdomen associated respiratory distress, which is often moderate to severe sinuses and poor or absent entry, air entry on the side of hernia. And we can even hear bowel sounds in the chest. Obviously, heart sound would be displaced to the opposite side of the hernia. So uh, these two X-rays are the classical uh, uh, case, uh, presentation of this, uh, her, this uh, CDH. And we can see that there are multiple cystic sardos. Most likely, this is just stomach bubble. In this case, also, there is a cystic sardo. So all these are uh, suggestive of diaphragmatic hernia. Then other important thing apart from the X, the X-ray is often diagnostic uh, most of the time, but then we have to look for the uh, rule out for the cardiac anomalies also and uh, quantify the pulmonary hypertension and uh, heart function by the echocardiogram. Another investigation like ultrasound abdomen and ultrasound cranium to look for the rule out, ruling out the other anomalies. So management uh, in the Western world, when it is, it can be done in the fetal period in the form of uh, uh, tracheal plugs. And it it is it buys the concept of that whenever you plug the tra fetal trachea, it leads to the expansion and uh, stretch of the lung that leads to the pulmonary better pulmonary growth. So it, it is one of the mechanism to encounter to take care of the pulmonary hypoplasia. So uh, this is one procedure. So it is in the different name that plug and fit into the plug is like plug the lung until it grows. And then there are fit and do so it, it, it form in the form of the pul either pulmonary balloon or there is a clips or uh, that can be the trachea can be occluded and it leads to better survival. But this this is not way, uh, I, I can say this is not very much done in our country. Apart from that, if there is a severe pulmonary hypoplasia, so there is also a concept of exit procedure because this baby is of. Uh, if it is very severe, the babies may even succumb in the delivery room. So uh, it is also uh, followed that they are delivered by via exit and exit to ECMO is done even in the delivery room. Because uh, the CDH is no longer considered as a uh, surgical emergency because it is very important that one ha baby has to be stabilized before the surgical repair is done. So often uh, exit procedure is done and then baby can even be shifted to ECMO in severe cases depending on the antenatal prediction of the lung uh, growth. Then preoperatively, uh, we have to take care that we have don't have to do any back and mask ventilation in the delivery room. Orogastric tube should be there for decompression because already the uh, additional content are there that should be decompressed to avoid more of the respiratory compromise, pulmonary mechanical ventilation, treatment of pulmonary hypertension. We will see it in details a bit. So in the delivery room management, uh, we have to see if the, it is very severe. It has to be directly intubated. Then ventilation and strategy we have to see and how we have to manage the PPH and surgical procedures. So this situation should be done according to the NIP guidelines. Avoid back and mask ventilation, orogastric decompression, and get the vascular access as early as possible. So those babies who are uh, having good lung de de development, they even can have a spontaneous breathing, so they could be assessed very carefully and shifted to the delivery room uh, vigilantly. Then uh, we have to do a gentle ventilation. So even if in the delivery room, if you have to uh, give the uh, positive pressure ventilation, uh, it is preferable to, to use uh, TPC associated device, which have facility of PEEP measurement, PEEP uh, delivery. So apart from the ambu bag, this is advantage. So uh, with gentle ventilation and optimal ventilation with the positive and expiratory pressure is always welcome. Uh, one, if one has to ventilate, often the PIP requirement of 25 to 28 centimeter of water, one has to be used judiciously and not target the saturations very much because if we uh, increase the pressures very high, then it can lead to lung injury and pneumothorax is pretty common in these cases. Tidal volume of 4 to 6 ml per kg, PEEP of 4 to 6, and SPO2, uh, FIO2 as per guided SPO2, rate of 40 to 60 and flow uh, 5 to 7. It is important to understand that in the cases of CDH, often in the first three to four hours, your saturation, rectal saturation may be as low as 70%. And uh, if overall baby is looking uh, good for fish, that should be ac acceptable. And one should not do very over jealous ventilation and, and be very careful to take care of both respiratory and hemodynamic stabilities simultaneously. 
because if we try to over ventilate this period maybe uh, may not transition well and cardiac dysfunction starts and it subsequently worsens so uh, over and above once the baby has been stabilized within 6 to 8 hours and other uh, the 12 hours in severe cases often uh, your if, if your saturations are not maintaining and your requirement are very high if you have reached your uh, high pressure on the conventional ventilation hf high frequency ventilation with the rescue therapy and it works uh, well in uh, cdh then this bp should be sedated properly uh, with the fentanyl uh, opioid analgesia but non muscular walking should be avoided because it leads to a lot of uh, lung fluid retention and that could be detrimental for the ventilation then uh, in the pre surgery stabilization uh, surfactant has been tried in various trials and it has not been shown to uh, improve any uh, survival so surfactant use should be justified and customized as per gestation rather than using it in uh, all cases universally then coming to the pulmonary vasodilator therapy so specific pulmonary vasodilator we all know that it is inhaled nitric oxide and uh, it is something which has worked very well in various uh, registries of cdh patients so if the oxygen index is more than 20 or higher one has to start the ino at 20 ppm and continue with as per protocol then uh, so definitely management is surgical so once the baby has been established after up most day after 48 to 72 hours they are taken for the surgery and it can be done either via thorax or abdomen even laparoscopic surgeries are being tried these days and uh, closure of defect is done if it is large then mesh can be needed and post operative care requires ventilation nutrition and supportive care the long term uh, follow up is uh, beyond the purview of this presentation because we have to discuss lot of uh, emergency so i will be briefly discussing the relevant point coming to the next surgical uh, emergency is a congenital lower emphysema and this 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 uh, disease is very this malformation is very important uh, to identify and we should look for what is the problem because it is very frequently misdiagnosed as a pneumothorax so what happens in the uh, congenital lower emphysema there is a malformation in the bronchial cartilage and that is a collapsible cartilage so it leads to air trapping of the ciliated lung and one of the lobe of the lung enlarges very uh, high and it becomes emphysematous leading to the to the hyperlucent shadow and uh, it often mimics a, a case of pneumothorax so it can be low, lobar regional or segmental it usually affects upper and middle lobes on the right and uh, upper lobe on the left so clinical presentation would be in the form of the respiratory dis distress decreased air entry on the affected side dis uh, displaced cardiac impulse to the opposite side and x ray is often diagnostic but ct may be needed in some cases in, in case of confusion so management remains the respiratory support and surgical lobectomy of the emphysematous lung so this is a classical uh, x, uh, x ray of the a case of congenital lobar emphysema and it is so huge that it is leading to the herniating uh, the lung towards the other side so uh, it is it has to it is often identified on the x ray in, in case of uh, uh, confusion one can go for the ct thorax next malformation is, is the congenital pulmonary airway malformation on congenital cystic uh, edematoid malformation so previously it was uh, taken as a c cam but now it is told as a c pam which is a new uh, terminology so in this case there is a mal development of a small airways and lung parenchyma and often the the bronchial and alveolar structures uh, is translated into the cystic and non cystic forms so it is often another one of the cystic uh, differential diagnosis of the cystic shadows in the lung and it is divided into the uh, five types starting from the type 0 and uh, simpler classification is from the in the form of macro cystic or micro cystic form prognosis is worse in case of large cystic masses associated with the mediastinal mid cyst or polyhydramnios and pulmonary hypoplasia it can often uh, even present as hydrox fetalis so clinical presentation could be asymptomatic or respiratory distress and uh, in case of uh, respiratory distress one has to go for immediate resection of the symptomatic mass so uh, it can often uh, recur and uh, if not Uh, taken care at suppose in asymptomatic cases uh, if uh, if one wait for a longer time there is increased risk of infection malignancy so uh, in this x ray there there are 
small small uh, cystic shadows in this uh, left side of the lung and with the displacement of the heart and this is a case of cpam so uh, the presentation is often variable in cases of cpam like cdh would often be symptomatic C cla would often be symptomatic but cpam cases may remain asymptomatic and in some cases the antenatal diagnosis is there and baby is born without symptom but then these cases has to be followed up very carefully and parent has to be counseled regarding that that in case of any uh, respiratory embarrassment they have to rush to the hospital immediately another one is the bronchopulmonary sequestration so as the name suggests a part of the bronchus and lung sequestered to the uh, apart from the normal lung area so what it is it is a uh, mass of non functioning lung tissue that is not connected to the tracheobronchial tree and most important feature is that it receives its blood supply from one or more anal venous systemic arteries not from the pulmonary vasculatures so it could be either in the thorax that is called as intralobar or extralobar depending on the whether it is inside or outside the pleural lining and mostly it is asymptomatic in the neonatal period but it may present as a mild cyanosis and respiratory distress if the lesion is large if not taken care and not identified early this sequestrated lung may uh, get infected or uh, may present with a unilateral effusion or may even has presented with the hemoptysis in the adult cases so uh, chest x ray may be normal or it may reveal a triangular shaped sh shadow so in case of suspicious shadow when one can not, not attribute it to the pneumonia or uh, associated systematic systemic signs one should can go for the uh ct thorax to get the information so again the uh, treatment is surgical removal so we would see in the radiology this is a triangular kind of shadow in this x ray so one cannot be very sure that it is a sequestration for the diagnosis we have to go for the ct it could be a pneumonic patch also if the baby is presenting with the fever and systemic signs you can say that it is a it is a patch of pneumonia but this is the same x ray and this is the ct of the same patients it is you can see this is a sequestrated part and once the angiography is done you can see that supply is coming from the aorta and it is a huge vessel which is uh, supplying this sequestrated part so in this condition ct is very important and um, uh, ct angio is very important to identify the blood supply because often when a surgeon is in doing the surgery they have to ligate this vessel and sometimes this vessel is very big so it has to be taken care very uh, carefully so that uh, perforative bleeding is not uh, it, it not comes as a catastrophe now coming to the gastrointestinal emergencies so coming to the tracheoesophageal fistula with esophageal atresia this is something which all the neonatologists would have seen sometimes or multiple times and uh, we this is something which is not a gastrointestinal problem but also respiratory problem because uh, airway and uh, intestinal upper part is developed together and uh, if there is a problem of esophageal atresia with fistula there would simultaneously would be having problem of the uh, lungs also so these cases requires a very uh, efficient uh, management pre operative also and uh, supportive management also so 85% of esophageal atresia have tracheoesophageal fistula again incidence is uh, pretty higher than the other lung malformations clinical presentation includes absent stomach bubble in the fetus or polyhydramnios clothing from the mouth after delivery when the baby is attempted to uh, feed uh, careful examination in the delivery room even can identify the baby if someone tries to pass the og tube in the uh, delivery room vomitings respiratory distress abdominal distension or required abdomen in case of isolated esophageal atresia and obviously difficulty and inability to pass um, a large size orogastric tube in the baby a small size tube may even pass the fistula in uh, some cases so uh, if, if someone has to diagnose the esophageal atresia one should try to pass a bigger bore or uh, uh, ot tube and get the x ray on that only so investigation so extra showing coiling of ot tube and uh, as i said that these anomalies again has a very high likelihood of the congenital heart diseases so echo should be done and echo is also very important because uh, surgical approach is important whether there is aberrant uh, right sided uh, aortic arch or other problem so they have to a surgeon has to go through the thorax so it, whether they have to go from the left side or right side as if that is also uh, getting help by the echo 
and all, again investigation to rule out other associated families that we all know that there is a ductal and better malformation sequence so in uh, those should also be ruled out and because it has to be taken care of and uh, uh, parent has to also to be counseled accordingly and if there is associated anomaly they should also be handled so uh, this is a diagrammatic representation the first one is the uh, the most common one this is a gross classification which is the most common one so in this case uh, there is a atresia with the fistula and this is the pure esophageal atresia and then uh, you have x type fistula then you have both side fistula so uh, this is the x ray of esophageal atresia where you can see a faint this is a i, I don't know whether it is visible very well on the projection or not but this is a coiling of the uh, og tube in the uh, upper part of the air neck so this is suggestive of esophageal atresia so pre operative management includes um, a refugial uh, catheter for the suction of the upper pouch which gets intermittently pulled up by the saliva of the baby and this saliva again gets uh, aspirated to the chest and for for the it leads to the compromise of the respiration so it has to be taken care very efficiently if someone doesn't have the fluid tube then it can be customized and made by the putting a small ug tube in the suction catheter and the suction pressure should be low in these cases approximately 20 to 30 because if you keep it very high the suction mucosa would be sucked out then baby should be in the prone position nursing is uh, relevant to avoid the aspirations respiratory support mechanical ventilation as per associated respiratory distress quantification supportive management of the fluid and electrolytes before surgery surgical man management include ligation of fistula and end to end anastomosis of the short segment esophageal atresia if it is a long, long segment esophageal atresia when has to go for the proximal esophagostomy with gastrostomy and definitive repair later the complication include anastomotic leak and mediastinitis sometimes defistulation also occur that is called as recurrence it's which is stricture reflux trichomalacia defective airway disease in follow up and survival rate in good center is more than 90% if the baby's weight is less gestation is less and there is associated congenital heart disease this is a poor prognostic factor then uh, coming to the coronal atresia this is most common congenital anomaly of the nose incidence is once in 7000 life births it can be either unilateral or bilateral bony or membranous and affected cases uh, are there is syndromic association is often common in form of charles syndrome or treacher collins syndrome and kalman syndrome clinical presentation is like uh, if it is unilateral it may go unnoticed and uh, asymptomatic or in case of respiratory infection this can be identified in case of bilateral there would be difficulty in breathing and respiratory distress at settle once baby starts crying so uh, again the diagnosis would be inability to pass form catheter through each nostril beyond uh, 3 to 4 cm into the pharynx uh, definitive diagnosis can be done by the fibrotic rhinoscopy and uh, for the pre surgical management we need a ct scan to look for the exact anatomy pre operative uh, uh, airway can be maintained by the oral airway or tracheostomy and the feeding can be uh, done by the feeding tube surgical is transnasal repair coming to the uh, another gastric span anomaly which is, that is due to atresia that is due to failure of recanalization of intestinal lumen incidence is one in per 10000 live births and <clears throat> this atresia is associated with other malformation in 70% of cases down is pretty much common we often encounter down syndrome with uh, adrenal atresia so intently it, it uh, presents as a double bubble or polyhydramnios clinical presentation is as a biased and vomiting within a few hours of birth or more than 30 ml of gastric aspirate just after birth and then this is the abdomen is not much sustained because the block uh, the problem is uh, right up in the upper abdomen so distension is limited to the upper abdomen only and abdomen x ray uh, is diagnostic so it reveals a double bubble which we can see in this x ray management is pre operative stabilization decompress of stomach ruling out other anomalies uh, identifying the syndromes with associated counseling and surgical is is the diamond do not must be done survival is pretty good in this cases then malnutrition uh, it is it results from absent intestinal rotation and fixation incidence is one in 6000 and uh, because of the inadequate mesenteric attachment the base of the mesentery is pretty uh, narrow and it leads to the uh, intestinal mortality very high that can lead to entanglement and uh, valvulus of the 
intestine. Other important fact is that the relation of the superior mesenteric artery and superior uh, mesenteric vein is opposite in this case. And even in it can lead to the obst obstruction of the some part of the intestine depending on the level of obstruction. So malnutrition can go unnoticed throughout the life. And sometimes uh, um, if it is diagnosed, uh, uh, if it, it presents with the volvulus, it leads to the bilious and non-bilious submitting and feature of intestinal obstruction. In case of uh, volvulus and ischemia, even gangrene and perforation is very uh, much common. So it is often said that if a uh, surgeon has a very high suspicion of uh, volvulus, it can even, uh, baby has to be taken in the midnight for the surgery. So it is very uh, catastrophic once the baby goes into the volvulus with the uh, gangrene presentation. So in the for the diagnosis, uh, we, we, we can go for the ultrasound for the relation of the SMA and SMB. There could be a St. colonic shadow in the right intestinal fossa, uh, uh, right LA fossa, and there should be there can, could be the right-sided jejunal markings of, uh, instead of left-sided markings. So uh, this is the contrast study in case of malrotation, and uh, this Dudnichinger junction is going towards the right side, and this is the image showing volvulus and resulting into the compression of the cecum and subsequent obstruction. So uh, the barium and the dye study show corkscrew appearance like which is uh, saw in this image. And uh, gaseous abdomen can be there in the midward gut volvulus and even it can present it as a double bubble also because uh, in some manner it is leading to obstruction in the upper part of the duodenum only. So management is again fluid and electrolyte, broad spectrum antibiotics if there is a population decompression and surgical led procedure is done to take care of it. Then uh, congenital hypertrophy pyloric stenosis, the incidence would be again similar for all the intestinal uh, malformation. And uh, important part for this uh, disease is that it presents in the most of, often in the male babies at uh, three to four weeks of age with the non bilious vomiting. And the olive size mass is detected in the right upper quadrant. A, a moving peristalsis can be also be observed. And uh, because of the persistent vomiting, a hypochloremic metabolic acidosis in, uh, encountered in the blood gases. And ultrasound finding may show a strange sign because of the elongated pylorus with the narrow lumen. Pylorus up, may appear duplicated due to uh, puckering of mucosa, so that gives a double track sign. So surgical management of pyloromyotomy, which can be either open or uh, laparoscopic. Then coming to the uh, another malformation that is exome loss. So it, it is just from the failure of mid-gut loop to the return to the abdomen at 10th weeks of gestation and uh, the gut remains unneated outside at the umbilicus as a mass and it is often covered by sac which may or may not be ruptured. Umbilical cord is, is at the apex and size of the defect may be small or large. So it may be associated with various other syndromes like uh, boil atresia, heart disease, big pigment syndrome, extrophy. Antenatal diagnosis is, is very easy in the ant antenatal ultrasound. One can see the uh, mass on the at the umbilicus portion in the fetus. Management is, uh, in this case, management is very much important to take care of the uh, intestinal content and the sac has to be very well covered with the uh, warm line gauge. Apart from that, uh, one should not handle this with the latex uh, gloves. Latex free gloves should be used and other component remains same like fluid electrolyte management, respiratory support, parental nutrition and decompression. Then uh, last effect uh, are initially um, tried to be epithelized via the beta adeno silver sulfur design and uh, a ventral hernia is created followed by delayed repair. A small sac can be primarily repaired. Then grass it is it is again uh, very similar to the uh, omphalocin, but the defect here is the towards the right side of oblicus and um, the protein with the bowel is not covered with any membrane. So in this case, the losses of the food and electrolytes are very high, and uh, there is as there is no covering, it should be uh, take, uh, taken very early. There could be associated atresia in this case also. So uh, more most often the management is similar to that of the omphalous hill, and uh, primary closure should be done if bowel can be easily reduced. 
and otherwise it can be taken care of as the ampullosis but there is often very high risk of the compartment syndrome in these cases so uh, this is a diagrammatic representation to look for the how a case of gastroparesis is that the intestinal is unneeded towards the side without any covering and this is the umbilical uh, cord in the case of ampullosis ampullosis everything is the umbilical cord and it remains at the apex of the mass then internal intestinal inter 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 atresia so atresia could be at various level and it is often attributed to the intrauterine vascular insult to the uh, developing intestine leading to the uh, uh, structure and ischemia ischemic damage leading to the atresia cocaine use in the mother and cigarette smoking the risk factor uh, and it can often even lead with the meconiomyelitis uh, as a cystic uh, mass can be there so antenatal polyhydramnios so is common with all the intestinal uh, obstruction cases and uh, it presents with abdominal distension with bilious vomiting so in case of intestinal atresia apart from the duodenal obstruction it is important that abdominal distension distension would be very specific feature apart from the vomiting in the case of uh, uh, in the abdomen x we can find uh, various uh, air fluid levels and triple bubble sign in intestinal atresia and features of obstruction so management remains dissection and into endostomosis so uh, this is a dilated bubble loop in case of filial atresia this is triple bubble appearance in case of jejunal atresia this is a dilated bubble with the soap bubble calcification here once can see the calcification in case of meconiomyelitis then anorectal malformation this is again uh, important because uh, there could be uh, there could not be any anus and emergency colostomy can be needed so it is abnormality in the development of lower part of the gastrointestinal tract that is at the level of anus and rectum incidence in 1 in 2000 to 5 in 2000 defect range from mild to complex and again it, it can be associated with bacterial and rectal association so the clinical important feature is that there could be a absent or a normal position of the anus there could be a fistulous opening through the uh, which urine or mucus may be coming sometimes it will be it is from the urethra in the female in, it in the it can be in the vestibule so uh, classically prone cross table lateral x ray is done putting a, a opaque object to look for the uh, intestinal uh, gas content that how much is the uh, is the um, defect so that to identify whether the colostomy is to be done or primary repair is to be done so abdominal x ray prone cross table x ray should be done at 12 to 24 hours of age not very early x ray would often not give a clue because it takes time for the gases to reach the uh, colon and rectum so one should not be doing x ray very early then uh, mri better delineate soft tissue and sphincteric muscle so better uh, because uh, if the sphincteric muscle are not taken care under at the time of surgery the outcome would not be good so management again uh, remains the Plus, uh, fluid electrolytes and respiratory support, and uh, such posterior surgical and rectal plasty is the commonest surgical repair which is performed. Then uh, Hirschsprung disease, which is due to the problem of neural innervation of the intestinal mucosa, and it is because of the failure of neural crest cells to form the mantle plexus. So we can understand that there is a, a aberrant, a, a absent neural innervation of the intestine at the lower part. So. the clinical features include delayed passage of meconia vomiting abdominal distension constipation diarrhea or exclusive stool on the rectal examination diagnosis is by succession by of the of the rectal mucosa with histology so in lack of ganglion nerve cells or hypertrophy blood ending on the ach estercolin stress staining very minimal would show narrowed distal colon with proximal dilatation abdominal x ray show features of the large wall obstruction management remains same as a good left light bowel decompression and the, uh, for the definitive surgical management is the pull through procedure which can be done in the acute if the baby is having significant uh, problem with the constipation and stool passage otherwise repeated decompression are done and the surgical repair even may be done at the later stages so this is a very minima with the transition zone and uh, narrow a ganglion zone with the diluted sigmoid colon and uh, biopsy of the rectal mucosa shows hypertrophic nerve endings but no ganglion cells then hepatobiliary so biliary atresia uh, again it is a kind of emergency because uh, if it is not uh, 
identified, diagnosed, and referred at an appropriate center within time, the lifelong morbidity remains. And uh, even with the uh, early surgical repair, there are problems. So what we all should identify such cases early and uh, uh, investigate and refer it early to the appropriate center. So there is obliteration or discontinuity of the extra periodic bilirates, yeah? Presented to the obstruction to the bile flow and obstructive jaundice or con conjugated jaundice in the, is the presentation. There could be associated anomalies. Clinical presentation is jaundice, clay colored stool and hepatosplenomegaly. Ultrasound so triangular cord sign. Hedias can is there for the excretion. Liver biopsy uh, is informative and peroperative cholangiogram is diagnostic. Then management is a preoperative nutrition and supplementation of fat soluble vitamins. Surgical procedure remains just like photo and trust me. And liver transplantation is the latter life. So about, out of all uh, we'll trace cases, only 15% uh, would be uh, doing well with the potent trust in trust me and uh, almost 85% will require liver transplantation later in life. Then a few about renal system. So first is the POB. It is, I would say, most common renal malformation. So there is an obstructive membrane fold within the mucosa posterior ethra. Most common cause of obstructive uropathy and urinary tract obstruction. Incidence is 1 in 5,000 to 8,000. There are three types and the classification is called as young classification. Clinical picture would include uh, ascites in the fetus, enlarged bladder and kidneys, poor urinary stream, decreased urinary output, and this even respiratory distress due to associated pulmonary hyperplasia in severe cases. Ultrasound may show thick wall bladder, bilateral hydronephrosis and hydronephrosis. Uh, is scanty liker in antenatal cases. Keyhole sign that means dilated bladder with the posterior ethra, eco bright kidneys. Postnatal ultrasound showed again the dilated urinary system uh, above the posterior ethra. And uh, MCU that is voiding posterior ethrogram uh, would, would again be important to look for the associated reflux and more delineation of the renal tract. So, this is a case of uh, PUV. You can see this is a dilated posterior ethra and this is hugely enlarged bladder. So, uh, in the pelvic ureter junction obstruction, there is a permanent of urine flow at the junction of the pelvis, renal pelvis with the ureter. So, uh, there would not be any bladder enlargement or ureter enlargement in these cases. And uh, lesion may involve the ureter junction intrinsically or maybe extrinsic compression because of the some kinks or fibrous bands. Left side is more commonly involved. There would be the enlarged kidney lump and the renal function or increased risk of UTI. So diagnosis is by the ultrasound. Again, MCU is important and management remains conservative or as later on, there is a uh, BY plasty or Anderson high pyeloplasty is done. The next trophy bladder, uh, this is due to the failure of mesenchyme to migrate between the ectodermal and endodermal layers of the lower abdomen. So lower abdominal mass is there, low septum like cord is there, ab abnormal genitalia and it widened pelvis. Their pelvis is not approximated. So this is very well, uh, this is also easily identified the on the penetral ultrasound. And uh, there could be associated a spinal cord anomaly, so that should also be uh, evaluated properly. And the surgical repair is in turning of bladder, which is the approximate approximation of the pubic synthesis. It is a stage repair, but before the stage repair, the general supportive care and the uh, care of the uh, exposed content is very important. A uh, few about the nervous system, that is a uh, uh, neural tube defect. So again, uh, it is a most common type of word, one of the most common type of word defect and open is meningomyocele or meningomyelocele that or the closed is spina occulta. So most often what we see is the fluid field cystic swelling in the back of the uh, mid, mid, midline region. There could be associated to a bladder wall control because of the uh, poor innervation of the uh, bladder wall function. And there could be poor sensation and power of the lower limbs. There could be can be enlarged head and club foot. So diagnosis prenatal is easier. There are various uh, serum markers also which can identify. Postnatal uh, is obvious, but MRI and CT is important for the planning surgical repair. Ultrasound KUP should be done to look for the urinary system and associated anomalies. A screening uh, one should uh, evaluate for the sepsis and meningitis. Then uh, seen prone position, care of the back with moist dressing, bladder bowel care, and subsequently closure of the defects. 
and approximately 85% would have associated uh, hydrocephalus problem. So efficient is all, all often needed in these cases. So these are the various neural defect, defect and carefully, spinal rhychosis, spinal spina bifida, closed bifida, and uh, carefully and in -septicid. Then there is a congenital hydrocephalus or ventricular megaly during fetus or infancy. This presents as a large head open skull features, so skull sutures. The newborns often have a leeway because of the open sutures. So they uh, tolerate very much up to a certain extent. But after a certain extent, there would be associated vomiting, downward deviation of eyes and seizures. So in severe cases of hydrocephalus, baby will be symptomatic. And uh, diagnosis is uh, by transcranial ultrasound. Before the definitive procedure, we have to go for the CT or MRI. A uh, few about double cavity, who knows, and trachea. So, cleft lip. There is a split in the upper part of lip and uh, roof of the mouth, or that is cleft lip and palate. This is important surgical emergency because one has to take care of the feeding. So, it may extend up to the nose, maybe unilateral or bilateral, and uh, it leads to velopharyngeal insufficiency. There would not be proper occlusion. So, there would be problem with the feeding. We need, may, may need to have a uh, palatal occlusion device that is obturator and it is more common in males. Then there are se several risk factors in form of diabetes, smoking, genetics, anti conversion in mother. Problem are feeding problem, speech problem, hearing problems, and ear infections, and uh, over and above cosmetic issues. So, management involved multidisciplinary team, which includes plastic surgeon, dentist, and orthodontist, ear, nose, and ENT doctor, dietitian, and audiologist. Repair is done. Uh, for the lip, it is done at three to six months of age, and for the palate, it is nine at nine to eighteen months of age. Corneal atresia we have discussed, and I would end the presentation with the key messages that surgical emergencies are common by virtue of practicing neonatology or pediatrics. Often the baby would come to you. It is our uh, uh, duty that we should be uh, knowing about this information. We should be identifying about this information. We should not just be discarding this this babies and we should be appropriately counseling and referring these cases because they need a lot of counseling. Often it is uh, uh, taken this thing that parents are, uh, parents are said that is So they, they should be referred at appropriate center and there are various programs and uh, government initiatives in which the patient can be uh, even got a free treatment. So that it is important that we should know, we should identify, we should give a primary treatment, we should uh, facilitate and then subsequently we can uh, have a uh, refer to the appropriate center. Then it is not only that uh, they require a lot, lot of emergency management and the management is pretty much common to what we do in day-to-day -day neonatal intensive care units. So it is again the uh, nutrition, uh, ventilation, the nutrition, the electrolytes, the hypothermia, the hypoglycemia. So the, the main uh, medical management remains same. We just only have to take care of the and understand the anatomy that what should be done in particular case and what should not be done in particular case. If we know the etymology, it would be easier to uh, manage and uh, the management would always be multidisciplinary. It is not a single specialty management. It involves a lot of people and a lot of surgical specialties. So, thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for elaborate presentation and covering all the important aspects in uh, uh, surgical emergencies uh, in NICU. There are a few questions. First question is uh, by Dr. Siddharth. He wished to ask uh, if we are uh, the right time to operate uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Is it immediately after birth or should we wait for 24 to 48 hours? Obviously, it is not immediately after birth. It is no longer a surgical emergency. It has to be uh, done uh, obviously after stabilization, mostly at 42 hours, 48 to 72 hours, or 24 to 72 hours, I would say. Okay. Uh, um, other, uh, what are the most important parameters to which a pediatric resident or a pediatrician should look in antenatal scans so that they can, they should not miss any kind of surgical or any kind of uh, fetal. Uh, malformation, uh, like mostly uh, and the NSG uh, and mostly the scans, they are uh, well informed. But like there are always chances of human error. To upgrade clinician, are there any specific parameters on antenatal scan which a pediatrician should always look into? I would say that uh, uh, in any case, one should always ask for TIFA whether TIFA was done or not. 
So T5 is a, a specific anomaly scan which requires approximately 45 to 1 hour at a good obstetric center at 16 to 20 weeks or for the cardiac anomalies and uh, uh, brain anomalies even at the 24, 22 to 24. So approximately one can ask in the second trimester ki, uh, se bhi ke time pe koi aapka detail ultrasound hua tha kya. So maybe aisa hua, hua hota hai, but unko pata nahi hota hai. So aap wo puch sakte hai. Aur, aaj, you would often found, find that uh, in the name of TIFA or a special ultrasound, even the ultrasound are done, which are not informative. So it is very much important that whether a scan was done to delineate for the, especially look for the anomalies. That is a TIFA scan. That is targeted imaging for the fetal anomalies. So one can ask for that. Even if there is no problem or it is, uh, it, it is said that it is apparently normal. Uh, I would say that oligohydramnios and polyhydramnios are something which is, uh, especially polyhydramnios is something which is, which again points out that, uh, towards that one should be careful regarding the gastrointestinal or, or uh, uh, neurodevelopment, neurological anomalies. So uh, polyhydramnios and oligohydramnios is again one of the important factors. Then abnormality of the fetal movements. So a scan is something which is uh, not our, uh, we have to be dependent on what the obstetrician or sonologist or radiologist has said in the report. Again, with the best, even if with the best of the sonologist or uh, uh, the 70%, it is, it may be accurate for the 70% only. Even uh, a lot of antistinal atresia is, it is not uh, true that esophageal atresia would be diagnosed antenatally. It is not of always all the antistinal atresia would be diagnosed. Donal atresia is okay. CDH is okay. Uh, CLE may or may not. CCAM is okay. Sequestration may be missed. So, lot of things are not uh, it is not black and white that it, if it, it was not identified, then there is something wrong or often parents may uh, argue also with the, you that why it was not there. So I would say that these are the things which you should especially look, look for. You, I, and over the time in whichever area one practices, they know that who is the good one, uh, uh, radiologist, where, in which reports we have to rely on. So, I, uh, specifically in the TIFA reports, one has to good look for the lungs, how are they, what is their volume, uh, and uh, for the intestine, whether the things have been mentioned properly or not. So, that is all. Ma'am, any specific uh, deficiencies in mother which leads to these surgical problems or, defi or uh, malformations in children? Any association with specific no. deficiencies? Number one, the folic acid that we all know. So that is specifically uh, associated with the feed, uh, neural tube defect. But apart from that, uh, cigarette smoking, uh, drugs use, cocaine smoking, and I would not say that it is not common in the country. So it is common in the country. And uh, over and above, then often the uh, chronic diseases are becoming very much common in early ages with, with the, because of the metabolic syndrome. So some often the... Uh, uh, mother would be on, uh, mother would have some pre existing chronic disease for which she may be taking some medications. So if those medications are not taken care in the uh, early embryonic phase, like that is first three months, then that could be a problem, especially anti convulsants. So, and it's, it is very important that people often hide the history of epilepsy in them. So, these things specifically should be looked for, and uh, the education is the only thing which can avoid all this. So, to, to those who ever are on, on any chronic uh, medical illness, they should be taking care of their uh, medications properly, and uh, they should be planning the pregnancy uh, according to the advice of the obstetrician. They should be pre preconceptual planning in this, these cases. And when we manage these cases in NICU, is there any specific recommended uh, strategy on ventilation and uh, any specific strategy on enteral nutrition for these cases. For sake of an example, when we manage a case of tracheoesophageal fistula or esophageal atresia, um, how do we ventilate them? And uh, similarly, for such cases, when we start them on feeding, what should be our uh, uh, timeline to move from TPN to enteral or how do we decide that? Uh, esophageal atresia uh, may, may get difficult with the ventilation preoperatively because with the fistula, there occurs some leak. So that could lead to the uh, uh, distension of the abdomen. So 
I would say that one should use proper size uh, AT tube or maybe even curved AT tube. Number one. Number two, ventilation strategy would be depending on the injury to the lungs. If a baby of esophageal atresia would be coming to you after much of handling and 24 to 48 hours, they may already be having a lot of aspiration of saliva and uh, even may feeds also if it has been tried. So in those cases, already the uh, pulmonary pathology is there. So the, obviously the pressure and volume ventilation would always be, be better in such cases. But if one is... Uh, uh, confident in the volume ventilation, then it is fine. Otherwise, the routine uh, ventilation and strategy which you will opt for the case of pneumonia would hold true for the uh, esophageal atresia. Yeah. But one has to take care of the leak. The ET should not be leaky in such cases because it can be detrimental. If the PHB has been, uh, uh, surgery has been done. So after the surgery, 24 to 48 hours, one has to be, uh, one should not, uh, there, is, there is elective ventilation, which, what one follow in such cases because the, your surgical repair site is pretty close to the uh, trachea. So the, there would be problem with the sutures, the sense. So the sedation and, ge and gentle ventilation for the 48 hours after the surgery is very much common. One should not do unnecessary suction. The heating and humidification should be very well so that ET tube doesn't get locked. And for the 24 to 40, 40, 48 hours after the surgical repair of esophageal atresia, the tube should be taken care of very well. It, there should not be any accident fixed to patient. And over and over, there they would always put a transanastomotic feeding tube that should not be accidentally pulled out. So uh, it is often a common practice that they would fix it very pro properly. The surgeon is very uh, careful that sometimes they even suture to the nose also, so that it should not uh, get accidentally dislodged. And feeding uh, as early as baby is hemodynamically stable, we often start feed after 48 hours by the transanastomotic tube. Uh, and uh, that is minimal internal nutrition. By four to five days post-operative phase, we uh, advance it very fast. That is internal nutrition. For the uh, parental nutrition, again, the requirement, what we use for generally sick babies in, as per term and preterm, that would be a uh, protein of 2.5 to 3, uh, a lipid of uh, 2 to 2.5, and GIR of 6 to 8 that we follow. So obviously for the day one, you would not be able to give that much. So uh, incremental kind of strategy is good. Uh, when we talk about TPN, ma'am, in such cases, we start with the uh, uh, amino acid-based formulas and followed by lipid. So what should be our... Now, what should be our initial settings for starting? What should be our initial um, load which we which we think can tolerate this? These children can tolerate. I mean, you okay. are talking about the parental amino acid. Yeah, parental nutrition. Yes, ma'am. They can tolerate one point five gram per kg on day one very well. Okay. Okay. Fine, ma'am. Uh, it was a it was again a pleasure to have you and uh, teach us and. The way you have, uh, you know, in one hour long session, you have covered all the all the very important surgical and uh, other kind of neonatal emergencies. And with these questions, which I have put, these are the questions which are being shared by general pediatricians who who have been managing such cases in peripheries, and uh, they usually wanted a strategy to understand how they can transport these children which usually are being referred to uh, tertiary care centers. To start these children on TPN is the least they can do at their setup. So is and, there any... Yeah. Yes. So oh. uh, transport tissue is very much important. And often what is not good in our country is that uh, transport is not often communicated properly. So a lot of times the uh, center would be, especially the uh, government sector would be uh, taking and uh, approaching the baby uh, at a certain there would not be any prior communication so number one there should be a prior communication because uh, it is not only the NICU which has to be prepared it is also the surgical team which has to be prepared apart from that uh, uh, apart from the nutrition and hypoglycemia and hypothermia management in a specific management is important for the uh, other cases like in the case of cdh it is uh, OG tube is important in case of uh, decompression is important in case of compressor seal. Uh, the care of the wound is important in case of MMC. Baby has to be nursed laterally and in prone position. That is important. So small, small things. So that would be specific to the disease. 
and uh, of course the parenteral nutrition and the fluids and uh, suctioning of the secretions in the case of esophageal atresia so ongoing uh, aspiration can be avoided during the transport so those i again the tabc uh, temperature and hypoglycemia if managed the rest of the things can be taken care of anyways and so that are the most important thing we do get worse in because of those problems only and uh, a communication is the key and i would say that more the cases you see and uh, manage and uh, understand the more you know so none the number of esophageal atresia you have seen the number of cdh you have seen the number of meningomyelitis you have seen the number of renal atresia i have seen you will be more knowledgeable and more experienced and competent also thank you ma'am uh, once again uh, on behalf of all the students and uh, giving this time from a busy schedule it means a lot ma'am thanks a lot thank you. thank you so much sir thank you take care thank you everyone for joining